The story of the underdog kingdom surviving the onslaught of the powerful empire is a story older than fiction and became a staple of fantasy ever since the forces of Mordor came down upon the crumbling kingdom of Gondor. But normal empires are not ruled by a dark lord inhabited by a cabal of wretched orcs or placed within a lifeless wasteland. Yet all empires have in common that they are evil. And in this video I am going to show you how to make an interesting villainous empire by focusing on imperialism and colonialism without turning it into a generic evil overlords empire. Question 1. Why does your empire conquer? This question might look easy to answer at the first glance, but gets more and more complex the longer you think about it. A wealth and land acquisition, ideological or religious reasons, prestige and culture, a bit of luck and the whims and aspirations of a monarch might all play a role why polities might suddenly start conquering and gain imperialist ambitions. In most cases economic reasons were the primary factor, like everywhere else in human civilization. Let's look at the reasons why the Greek city-states began colonizing the coasts of the Mediterranean and Black Seas. The Greek city-states might not have been an empire, which means that each city-state had various reasons why they founded their colonies, but their main reasons were generally economic. The cities were stricken with overpopulation, the farmers plots and lands were split by so many generations of sons at one point that it became impossible to feed their own families. At the same time they saw the economic opportunity to have a sister city at certain already established trade routes. While in some cases, like for example the colonies in the Black Sea region, especially around modern day Ukraine, were primarily founded because of its fertile soil, becoming the breadbasket of the ancient Greek city-states. The Greek city-states and their colonization efforts might be one of the few examples where the colonization sparked myths instead of the other way around. While the Greek colonies were relatively harmless, considering the relatively low population density around the places they settled, the newfound cities did have their quarrels with the local populations at multiple times. The reason why your empire expands is important because it gives your empire extra weight and it makes it easier to explain their behavior in the following two questions. An empire that conquers, colonizes and expands for simply economic reasons might be way more lenient to the uh, new population and in other cases they are brutal and exploit as much as possible. It all depends on what they are looking for there. Other empires that use religious or ideological reasons for their conquests might be way harsher too, but neither is really set in stone. Question 2. How does your empire conquer? expand and colonize. The most obvious and most common way to expand your empire is by martial means of course. You send in your military, overwhelm the local populace and claim the land as yours. You could send some people who just settle in that land beforehand if you think that land is extra free. The exact way your empire conquers depends on your empire's reason however. You wouldn't slaughter and pillage an entire city's worth population if you want to be seen as the good trademark ruler. You'd find people in favor of your rule within the city's ruling class that help you establish your rule, maybe even without having to ever besiege the city. Your imperial ambitions aren't even necessarily bound to military power at all. Diplomacy can be a good way to expand your own borders, or at the very least your family's borders, vastly. The Austrians, or rather the Habsburg family, were probably one of the best at that. Let others wage war, but thou, happy Austria, marry, was one of their mottos after all. The House of Habsburg ruled over an empire that spanned the whole world and most of that they gained through lucky and calculated marriages. They became the rulers of Spain, Portugal, Hungary, modern day Czechia and other regions in Europe through diplomacy and marriage maneuvers alone which put them and their rule in a very interesting position as the relationship with the people outside their original borders 
were very different to a more militarized conquest. Well, if you ignore Spain's and for a short time Portugal's colonial possessions, of course. I'm solely talking about Europe right now. The House of Habsburg weren't the most religiously tolerant rulers, but as long as you were Catholic, the rule over their territories were very decentralized and hands-free. Well, military conquest is the most interesting and threatening way to make a villainous empire. You don't necessarily need to expand your empire through military means alone. Diplomacy and marriage can be just as interesting as you have seen with the Habsburg example. And maybe just as threatening, as there's even less of a justified case to make against the Empire's rule if they acquire the throne of your country via the legal framework of your country's succession. Before we get to question 3, I'm curious about the Empires and their Imperial conquests in your setting, so leave a comment if you want. And maybe you might even leave a like and subscribe for more world building videos in the future. Question 3. How does your empire rule? Classically, evil empires are portrayed as despoilers and pillage and loot and leave nothing but an endless wasteland in their wake. Sometimes they enslave the population and replace them with their own. At other times they merely implant their own rule, while forcing everyone to obey or perish. In the end, this question can be reduced to the question on how your empire prevents or quells resistance and how they extract the resources out of their newly acquired territory. I think the Romans might have the most famous way of doing things. They Romanized people, primarily the ruling classes of the different provinces, but still, they incentivized the ruling classes to speak Latin in the West, while everyone already spoke Greek in the East anyway, so they let them speak Greek. They brought education into the line, they handed out Roman citizenship to loyal locals, they emerged their own gods with the local gods, and so much more. Roman cultural influence in the West was that successful that kings and nobles larped Romanization for centuries after. The languages and cultures remained Latin, and provinces remained loyal to Rome even after they retracted the legions, especially Britain, at least until the Anglo-Saxons conquered the place. The way Rome held her provinces loyal made it possible for the West to last for way longer than it should have, while the East lasted even a thousand years longer. The Romans had a very carrot on the stick approach to the uh, provinces, but they weren't good rulers. If you even dared thinking about rebellion, your town might be razed to the ground and your people sold into slavery just for thinking about it. And depending on the whims of the current imperator that must deal with your town, they might even do it with Roman citizens. During the conquest of Gaul, as the Gallic people were led by Vercingetorix to rebel against Caesar, it is said that one million Gauls were killed and another million were sold into slavery. Which brings us to question number four. What are the layers of complexity of your empire's rule? What makes them evil? What makes them good? Writing an interesting empire has similar rules as writing an interesting character. Multifaceted, multidimensional characters are more interesting than predictable and one-dimensional characters after all. In this case, contradictions could make the most interesting case. The Greeks, who were arguably the least evil in their colonization, made themselves aware of the local circumstances before their new colonial endeavors and tried to add upon the local cultural and political landscape instead of disrupting it. Yet they entered in wars with and against the local populace. The colonial city-states like Syracuse and modern-day Marseille were usually ruled by tyrants and oligarchies and they might have become just as ambitious as their mother cities. The Habsburg's territorial gains within Europe were gained through diplomacy and marriage. They became Holy Roman Emperors for hundreds of years and ruled over Germany, Spain, much of Eastern Europe and Italy by simply putting out the right baby during the right time. 
Yet when it came to conquest and wars, they were just as ambitious as any other kingdom. The Italians suffered under the many wars the Habsburgs fought over the peninsula. The wars of religion the Habsburgs were a primary instigator of killed 20% of the entire German population and many more. And while they were veiled in religious fever, these wars were mostly a matter of power and economy. And I don't have to talk about the conquest of the Americas, which only really began under Spanish Habsburg rule after all. Which were atrocity after atrocity. And while the Romans put themselves up as cultured and noble, as the bringers of civilization to the barbaric folk outside their borders, they were themselves pretty barbaric. But I think nothing describes their contradictive nature better than the speech the Roman historian Tacitus attributed to the Celtic tribal leader Calgacus before the Battle of Mons Graupius in modern Scotland. You have not tasted servitude. It is no use trying to escape Roman arrogance by submission or good behavior. They have pillaged the world. When the land has nothing left for men who ravage everything, they scour the sea. If an enemy is rich, they are greedy. If he is poor, they crave glory. Neither east nor west can sate their appetite. They are the only people on earth to covet wealth and poverty with equal craving. They plunder, they butcher, they ravish and call it by the lying name of empire. They make a desert and call it peace. Tacitus had his own bias motivations to write the speech the way he wrote it, but given his Roman perspective, they were crudely aware of their own impact on the world, even beyond the spread of their civilization. Contradictions and complexities like these are paramount to create an interesting empire. It might obviously cause people to defend it, like people who defend the galactic empire in Star Wars or the empire of mankind in Warhammer 40k, unironically for some reason. But their complexities are the reason why they are interesting in the first place. This is the end of the video. I hope you liked it. If so, leave a like and subscribe and tell me on the way your empire spread their influence throughout the world. See ya!